I would like to welcome you all, and I particularly, you can tell I'm very excited that we have Girl Scouts here. This is an inauguration for the center to have our first troop of Girl Scouts, and they're from St. Paul's, Girl Scout Troop number 2158 and 2081. So that's a very great thing, and I welcome each of you particularly, and I welcome all of you to the continuing uh, programming that we're having in place, that I've put in place, uh, recognizing the first anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. I am Elizabeth Sackler, and it is my pleasure um, to be here with you uh, today. Uh, Beverly Lowry wrote this wonderful book, Harriet Tubman, Imagining a Life, a biography of Harriet Tubman. Let me tell you first a little bit, and it's only a little bit, because um, Beverly's uh, list of accomplishments and achievements really are very long. But I'd like to tell you that first, and then tell you how it is that we are here together today, and then all of us are here uh, also. Uh, Beverly is a professor of creative writing uh, at the MFA program at George Mason University. She started there in 1999, I understand. And for the last three decades, she has maybe more, she's been writing books, nonfiction, essays and articles, and short fiction. She has won in 2007 the Richard Wright Award for Literary Excellence, and she was a Rockefeller <coughs> Fellow, and she holds nu numerous distinguished visiting writer uh, programs that she's been involved with over the years, most recently at the University of Montana, which is 2008. She has been reviewed regularly in the New York Times book review section. And that's where I segue, and that's where we start to come together. Uh, I love reading the New York Times book review section, actually. It's possibly one of the favorite things that I like about the New York Times in, uh, when I get it on Saturday mornings. So I was going through and reading, and there's this review. And it's a review of Harriet Tubman imagining a life. I thought, my God, this sounds really fascinating. One of the things that was written very early on in it, it says, um, this is a quote from the, that review. Harriet Tubman, the novelist, Beverly Lowry's uh, contribution, is labeled a biography but subtitled Imagining a Life. Um, and this explains uh, her decision to emphasize the visual elements of Harriet's story, what things look like, places and clothes, faces and plants, the skies, and to thread the information from all its sources. And I said, this really sounds fascinating. I immediately got the book and immediately read the book. And part of what um, I loved so much about it, and I hope that you will have an opportunity, they're on sale and they're signed by Beverly down at the bookstore at the gift shop, um, is that, that Beverly imagined possibilities when there was no factual information about Harriet Tubman. She imagined, well, she might have done this because of this, or possibly because of that. Or she might have felt a certain way, but then again, she might have felt another way. So it takes you and your mind into that time um, of Harriet Tubman's work, her life, her struggles, and it gives you an opportunity to begin to imagine what it all must have been like. And it was really, really exciting. So I went into the office as soon as I finished it and put in a call to Beverly Lowry. I figured out how to find her somehow and called her or emailed her. I don't remember how it all began. And two days later, I received an email from a friend of mine who lives out in New Mexico who said to me, I have a friend by the name of Beverly Lowry who has just written a book and she's going to be here when you are out here in, in New Mexico and I thought maybe you would like to meet her. 
And I said, well, funny thing. I've already been in touch with her, and I would love for her to come and speak at the forum. And that was last summer. And we were both of us, Beverly and I, out in Santa Fe together at the same time and had lunch, and it was wonderful. And it was from that auspicious moment, I think, that I said, well, let's, let's have you come here, please, and speak at the center. And um, I just want to show you what my book looked like by the time I was finished reading it. <laughs> That's how much there is in here that for me has informed some of my thinking, some writing actually that I've done, and the way in which I've used it sort of as an ongoing reference. And I think no matter what age you are, and of course I'm saying that because we have now our wonderful Girl Scouts here, that I think there's something in this book for everybody. And so please help me and join me in giving a warm welcome to wonderful Beverly Lowry. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We did have a wonderful lunch. But Elizabeth went through the book with all those post-its asking me about different things. Now on page something, now on page something. So I had to interrupt my eating the whole time to <laughs> answer her questions. I'm thrilled to have, what is your troop number? 158. All right. 158 All right. I'm thrilled to have you here. Uh, I, I don't believe I've ever spoken to Girl Scouts before, and I'm going to um, change what I'm how I'm going to speak today because of you, because I don't want you to get uninterested. I wanted to address two questions. One was, uh, who was Harriet Tubman, and uh, who people think she is, and, and what she did that maybe people don't have as much knowledge of. And the other was the question I'm always asked, uh, which is, why Harriet Tubman? Why did I write about her? I was going to talk about that first, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about, I want to read a little bit from the book that maybe you all will be interested in, and everybody will be interested in, but, uh, and talk about who she was. When I address young people, I always ask that question. Do you know who Harriet Tubman was? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Any of you? Can you tell me? Okay, the Underground Railroad. All right, thank you. You're exactly right. I have asked that question many, many times of many groups of uh, young people up to, uh, into college, and the answer is always the same. It's the Underground Railroad. Often it's just that, Underground Railroad. Um, it, it's sort of like George Washington, founding father, Ben Frank, Benjamin Franklin, the kite. It's how she's known. I wanted to talk a little bit about that part of her life and then talk about the, the part of her life that's less well known is her participation in the Civil War as the first woman to go into a, a, uh, an armed campaign as a leader of that campaign. And up until not many years ago, she was the only woman, in a declared war, she was the only woman to have done that. I don't know if that's still true or not, since we've had a few other <laughs> wars and battles to um, think about. But, um, uh, so I, I, but in honor of my um, audience here, I want to read a little bit from the part of her life that we know more about. It's before the Underground Railroad there. Though she was enslaved in Maryland, which means she was property of some people. And she determined that she was going to get away before she was sold the way her sisters had been. And when the person was sold, they were never seen again, for the most part. They just were, they vanished. And she did not want that to happen to her. She felt like it would and she was probably right. Her brothers were afraid. Her whole family was afraid. She took care of her whole family. And she decided that if the brothers wouldn't go, they would stay, but she was going. And so she went 
in the late afternoon as the sun was setting, and I'm going to read a little bit of what it was like when she went. Now, she could not read or write, and there were no signs, there, were no, there was no roads, there were paths, and there was a creek and a river, and she had no other information to go on. She had a letter that somebody had given her, which she couldn't read, but she could give it to somebody in a, a safe house where people would help her and they would lead her to the next place. That's all she had. So I'm going to read a little bit of that. Night. The moon two nights pass full. Alone, Harriet walks into the unknowable dark, barefoot in her slave dress, heading perhaps along Marsh Creek. The Quakers have given black people land for their own church and cemetery up by Preston, the Marshy Creek Methodist. She may head there or pass on by, not wanting to lose time so early in the journey. Keeping to the wetlands, allowing the streams and creeks that run beside the Choptank River to guide her. She may well have her sights set on a spot near Greensboro, where the river narrows enough that it can be crossed on foot at the Red Bridge. Harriet keeps her mind on her business, leaving fantasy and fear to others. She has memorized Hannah Leverton. Hannah Leverton was a Quaker woman who gave her the piece of paper she has to take her on. She's memorized the instructions and may repeat them with every step to make sure she stays on the right path. She checks the chop tank, keeping it on her left to the west, and she has her piece of paper with the names on it to give to other people who can read. She knows the importance of a walking stick to poke along the ground in front of her, helping her to feel out what she can't see. Rabbit holes, sinkholes, logs, tree roots, roots, animal traps set by farmers. Nobody walks into alien territory without a stick. The first night, she makes as many miles as she can so that by the time she's discovered missing, she'll be far from Poplar Neck, where she lives, and even farther from Bucktown. By midnight, she's still making her way. September 17th, the night she left, becomes the 18th, exactly one year prior to the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. Next year, when other members of her family make their own flight to freedom, everything will be different, everything. Harriet may fall asleep in the woods in the early morning hours of the first night, waiting until late afternoon to approach the first safe house. When a woman comes to the door, she displays the paper given to her by Hannah Leverton. The woman responds by telling Harriet to get a broom and sweep the yard. People in the South often sweep their yards when there isn't much grass and they want the dirt neatly packed and smooth, but Harriet doesn't care for the idea of stopping. Nonetheless, she does as she is asked, figuring that the request is probably for the purpose of camouflage, so that a passerby will assume the woman has hired her out and will not suspect her as a runaway. That evening, the woman's husband comes in from farming. He loads up his wagon and after nightfall, helps Harriet in and then thoroughly covers her up. She crouches down, remains quiet. They bump along, watching out for patrollers and slave catchers. The farmer drives her to the outskirts of the next town where she gets out. Keeping to the shadows, speaking in whispers, he advises her where to go and how to find the next station. In this manner, she makes her way through Maryland. She follows the waterways in place of roads, through thickets and snake country, sleeping within the cradle of tree roots and in homemade caves, hiding in dense clinging foliage, marking the navigable creeks in her memory as she goes. In Maryland, she will say, turning to metaphor, the brooks run north. Steadily, she follows their lead. There is no organized system of assistance for runaway slaves at this time, beyond the loosely established web of abolitionists, Quakers, some Methodists, who will pass people from one meeting house or home to the next, careful to avoid the areas where slave catchers and vigilantes hide out, toward Delaware, Camden, Dover, Wilmington. She repeats the names to herself in the sequence she's been given, they are not states or towns to her, only places to get through and go from. 
In his autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, Frederick Douglass wrote of his own dream of escape. And this is a quote. We had heard of Canada, the real Canaan of the, the American bondsman, simply as a country to which the wild goose and the swan repaired at the end of winter, but not as the home of man. I knew something of theology, but nothing of geography. I really did not know at that time that there was a state of New York or a state of Massachusetts. There's several routes through Maryland that Harriet might have taken, perhaps moving quickly into Delaware, following the river to its headwaters near Camden, where there were active African-American abolitionists. Or she may have traveled on farther north in Maryland, closer to Wilmington. Either way, this last leg was perhaps the most dangerous and her friends must have taken special care to get her through it. There were bands of slave catchers who roamed the countryside there. And with fewer areas of wetlands, the bounty hunters had a better chance of spying a runaway slave making her way through the territory. Although what would later be called the Underground Railroad had not yet been organized, the people willing to assist runaways were dedicated and knowledgeable. With their help, Harriet made her way through Delaware. Pennsylvania is the goal, whatever Pennsylvania may be, Philadelphia. When she arrives at the state line, someone is with her who points it out to her and says, look, you've made it. Walk over that line and you are free. She steps across. Everything becomes new. Even the light seems to change. She looks down at her hands to make sure she's the same person. When she looks up, she sees the sun coming over the fields and through the trees and imagines the light as a glory over everything as if her farewell songs have come true and she has arrived at the promised land. I felt like she will tell Sarah Bradford in 1868, I was in heaven. But her feelings of euphoria quickly dissipate. I'd crossed the line, she'll tell Bradford. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. There's no one to talk to, no one to tell, no one knows where she is or what she's feeling or how far she's come. All the way from the frolic in the poplar neck chicken with Mary through the swamps and woodlands to here. No one here knows what life was like in Bucktown. She compares her situation to that of a man who was sent to prison for 25 years, who longed for home the whole time he was there, only re to return to find that his house has been pulled down and a new one put up in its place, his family and friends having gone, nobody knows where. No one is there to take him by the hand, no one to welcome him home. As she heads toward Philadelphia, she settles her mind with a moral decision. She has no right to individual freedom while others, those who are a part of her and whose presence her life belongs, are bound. Since she is free, so should her family be. She is the first daughter after all, the one who has come out successfully, the one who hears the voices and has the insight. Having been chosen, she believes, she has no right to do anything but obey, no choice but to use her gifts to take on responsibility for others. She makes a new resolve. Once she's made a home in the North, with God's help, she'll bring her family there. Before crossing the bridge into Philadelphia, she prays. I said to the Lord, I'm going to hold steady on you, and I know you'll see me through. She's the same person, but with a new resolve and a new name. From now on, she's Harriet Tubman. She crosses the Delaware, holding steady. We follow her. Um, I, I want to say, you know, I, I think that the first question anybody might ask about this. How did I know that? I mean, I d did try to, I wanted to write a life of Harriet Tubman in scenes um, without much analysis, with as little analysis as I felt I could, um, um, that the book would stand up without. And, but these, everything in here, I mean, you'll notice I said it's possible she did this, it's possible, nobody knows. The th the thing about Harriet is, and I've, I've been living it with her for so long, forgive me if I call her by her first name, it's very hard to think of her as Ms. Tubman, uh, I think for practically anybody. Um, 
that whatever she did, she did alone. And so all the stories that people say about how she went, what route she took, are surmises, or they come from her through somebody else. She did not read or write. None of this is written down by her. The person, as I mentioned in here, she told the story. Her first biographer was named Sarah Bradford. This was in 1868 when um, Harriet had a home with her family in Auburn, New York, which is in central New York um, on the Finger Lakes, if any of you all are familiar with that part of the state. Um, and so the woman who took down everything that you read, all the quotes that where she says, I felt like I was in heaven, she said that to Sarah Bradford, or Sarah Bradford told us she said that. The difficulty in writing the biography of someone who uh, could not read or write is that you were always depended, dependent upon somebody else's version of what happened, somebody else's language, uh, somebody else's interpretation, and also on uh, oral history, which does change uh, throughout the uh, centuries, the years, the months. And, um, and so uh, a, a biography of somebody who was enslaved, who does not read or write, of necessity is based on some speculation and um, on the imagination. I, for one, had no problem with that. I think history is written from a point of view by a particular person in a particular time, and um, to just pile up the facts is not to write a book, it's simply to pile up the facts. Um, but I, was try I tried to be careful to back up anything I said that was there were, I made up no quotes, and um, I, I made up nothing but I did not always know, obviously, what she did or what she was thinking, and I tried always to uh, let the reader know that that's what I was doing. And in the beginning, I said that, that that's what I'll be doing, so that you, the reader, would be prepared for that. Um, I think now I'll also just do another little reading and then I'll talk about um, the rest of what I wanted to talk about. When the war came, when um, in 1861, the Underground Railroad disbanded. The uh, area in which it traveled, it was not a real train. I'm sure you all know that. But it was uh, a method of travel, of transport from the South to Philadelphia, across New York State. Uh, this is Harriet's route. There were others coming up through Ohio and other parts of the country um, to Canada. After the fugitive slave law was passed, they could not just go to New York, they went all the way to Canada. But Harriet, I mean, the, the thing we have to remember about Harriet is she was just so dogged in her determination to do what she could, one person, to help her people. It is a great lesson for us all to sit around and think, oh, well, there's nothing to do, nothing will help, what can I do? Um, she just, this was gone, so the Underground Railroad was disbanded. She could not go down into Maryland because the war was there. So what could she do? The uh, Union troops went down to uh, South Carolina, to the Hilton Head and the islands down there, and um, made their way and took over the uh, forts there. And she managed pretty pretty soon after that to get down to South Carolina where she, this is where she led the um, armed campaign. And, but she said, this is her quote as quoted in a book by an abolitionist, the good Lord has come down to deliver my people and I must go to help them. So she found her way down there. She thought she was going to teach. Um, at first she cooked and um, she did teach people down there how to um, operate the, the freed slaves. And one of the interesting parts of her life down there is she had to have a soldier. She had to have a soldier who was open in his mind enough to know what she could offer because the Union off Army was 
altogether white at that point. They were just getting into using African-American men as soldiers, but no women. And she was not uh, in the army. She was not a real soldier. She was a warrior. I think I was a warrior, but not a soldier. And so while a lot of the uh, Union Army officers admired her and acknowledged what she had done, they did not put her on a ship or make use of her as a spy or um, as a soldier until most of them were from the East, from Harvard, West Point. A soldier named James Montgomery came. James Montgomery was from Kansas. He was from the West, and this is a lot about class and education as much as anything, a disciple of John Brown. And he did not believe in the etiquette of combat. He believed, man, you burn them down. <laughs> if you find them, you kill them all, burn them down, and um, free the good people. And um, the Harvard guys did not appreciate his method of warfare, just like they did not appreciate John Brown's method of warfare. But it took somebody like that to see Harriet Tubman, know what she had done, and she had a list of, uh, of uh, recommendations by people who knew what she had done, bringing her people out of slavery. And he took her on. And she and a friend of hers, Walter Plowden, who knew the rivers, were a part of this campaign. They could tell him, first of all, how to get through the river. It's a tidal river, so it's very difficult. And, and the people trusted her, so that when they arrived there, she could all these people who were, emancipation had already been declared, but this is a very remote area of South Carolina and the people were still enslaved. So this is a little bit from um, that part of it. The river is called, it's spelled like Cumbahee, but they, in South Carolina they call it the Scumbee, so I'm gonna call it the Cumbee. Um, By the end of May, plans are set for a raid up the Cumbee, the object of which is to destroy rebel lines of communication and gather recruits from among the laborers. And see, they are laborers now. They aren't enslaved anymore. Um, but they have not received the word. They have been uh, isolated, and they're in a very remote part of, of the state. And they are doing rice farming, and they have no idea that Lincoln has declared emancipation. They've sent word to the bonded laborers to listen for a signal. When they hear it, they're to drop everything and run. Montgomery has raised five companies. A portion of the 3rd Regiment Rhode Island Heavy Artillery will participate. For Harriet, the raid will offer her the first opportunity she has to go head to head with a lifelong enemy and using skill, deliberation, and force to wait to take away from them what never was theirs to begin with. The good Lord, she believes, has come to deliver her people, and she is taking her place in the lead gunboat of the expedition to help out. Navigating a river like the Cumbee requires patience, if not a tolerance for pure tedium. And because smoke is visible for miles, steam-driven expeditions begin under cover of darkness, usually at high tide and under a full moon, and end at the enemy's doorstep at daybreak before he is fully awakened. Harriet's mission embarks on the night of a new moon, the sky dark, but for stars. Clearly, James Montgomery is depending on Plowden's expertise to navigate the boat safely upriver, even in pure darkness. The Cumbie is narrow, shallow, winding and muddy, with ridges of sand that shift with the tides. Every nuance of its particular personality must be taken into account, secretly, silently and with all confidence. Under such circumstances, the military commander waits and watches, yielding the, to the knowledge of his scouts. On the night of June 1st, 1863, a Monday, Harriet and Walter step into the lead gunboat, the John Adams. A converted old East Boston double-ender ferry boat, the John Adams, while unfit to, for sea service, is small, dependable, agile, and strong, perfect for river work, especially on a river that twists and turns. She's seen such duty before. Okay, I'm gonna skip over. James Montgomery joins Harriet and Walter on the lead ship. 
Two other vessels follow, the Harriet A. Weed and the Sentinel. The troops load on. At 9 p.m., the boats carrying 300 soldiers, soldiers slide into the river. Under Plowden's guidance, they head north along the banks of Ladies Island, then angle west into St. Helena Sound, where helped by the incoming tide, they move toward the mouth of the river. Harriet is the only woman on the expedition, and it is a tribute to the fierce independence of spirit exhibited by both David Hunter, who is the general at the, uh, in South Carolina, and Montgomery, that they have insisted not just on making use of her expertise, but in having her board as well, on board. No other woman will plan and lead an armed expedition during the entire Civil War. Few women have done so in U.S. military history. A woman, a black woman, a former slave, she is in charge. She is General Tubman. On the morning of June 2nd at about 2.30 a.m., the boats reach the mouth of the Cumbee and there successfully cross the bar and move into the river. In the south, June brings hot nights and an abundance of mosquitoes, <coughs> the muggy darkness alleviated somewhat by the amber flicker of fireflies. fireflies. Frogs gulp and yelp, crickets sing a sharp noise like a ringing in the ears, fish jump and flop, an occasional dog bays. For the sake of secrecy, Montgomery orders the steam engines cut as low as possible, riding the tide to hush their movements. When they get closer to the rice fields, they can hear the burble of the bobolinks, called rice birds, who lurk and wait for early fall when they will fatten themselves before the harvest. By dawn, the Adams and the Harriet have reached their first destination <coughs> about 20 miles upriver. They drop anchor on the Colleton County side of the Cumbee. The sun is rising over the flat fields, red and slow. Fog rolls across the land. Having just finished their breakfast, the laborers have taken up their hose and are moving into the fields. At first light, Montgomery orders a steady pipe of the steam whistle and simultaneously sends troops and rowboats to the bank and into the fields. The people was all a hoeing, an old man named Minus Hamilton will remember. They was a hoeing in the field when the gunboats came. And when the fog rolls off and the sun comes through, the workers can see the boats and the black men in blue uniforms rising from the river armed and standing upright with their heads up, and they drop their tools and run. From the rebels, there's no response. After sending several false reports of approaching troops, pickets have been warned against making precipitous alerts, and so instead of firing off warning signals, they send messages to notify the planters and drivers. Negro troops, they report, are approaching. In 1905, remembering the raid, Harriet will break into laughter. I never seen such a sight. Some was getting their breakfast, just taking their pots of rice off the fire, and they'd put a cloth on top of their heads and set that on, rice is smoking, young one hanging on behind one hand around the mother's forehead to hold on, the other digging in the rice pot, eating with all his might. And she laughs again, remembering women holding tied up white blankets on their heads with their things done up in them. Any woman who didn't have a pot of rice had a child or two in her arms or holding on to her dress. Some were carrying two children, sometimes twins, one in each hip, one hanging on her neck and the other at her forehead. Some had pigs in bags thrown over their shoulders. Some carried flapping chickens tied by the legs, the pigs squealing, the chickens squawking, all running, running, running to the boat. By now, overseers, slave drivers, and plantation owners have streamed out into the fields to threaten the escaping workers, brandishing whips and guns, decreeing death to any man or woman who disobeys orders and doesn't follow them back toward the woods. Some call to the fleeing workers to run and hide, saying, the Yankees are going to sell them to Cuba. Nobody pays them any mind. Every man and woman in the field heads straight to the boat. Weeks afterward, Minus Hamilton, describing the morning to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, says, while his master was shouting, run to the wood, Yankee, come see you to Cuba, he went to the boat with his wife, he wearing only a shirt and pantaloons, she with only the frock and kerchiefs she had on. They left their blankets tied up on the bank and ran toward the black soldiers who were so presumptuous they came right ashore and held up their heads. When Higginson asked Hamilton his age, he says he's 88. 
My old master keeps all the ages in a big book, and when we come to the age of sense, we mark them down every year so we know. When Higginson asks Hamilton if he thinks he's too old to have come away, Hamilton thinks Higginson must be joking. Too old for come? Never too old for leave the land of bondage. I old, but give a thousand thanks every day. So um, that, that was the picture of what happened. The boats became so crowded that they began to sink. And uh, James Montgomery asked Harriet to sing a song that would sort of calm the people because they were panicked for good reason, because the uh, slave owners were just behind them, the plantation owners, and would come and hurt them, torture them, capture them, and take them back. But they were, the Union troops were in charge, and they had to calm the fleeing workers so that they wouldn't sink the boat, and they could wait for the next boat to come and take them. So it was Harriet who sang the song, and there's a famous picture which is in the book a drawing that was in the Harper's Magazine of the time of the boat landing and all the, the rice workers coming down from the fields onto the boat. And when they got back to, um, to shore, there was a, um, a big meeting of people and apparently, according to Wisconsin newspaper, Harriet spoke, she is not named, but um, it is, she's called a former slave woman who, um, was the head, the captain of the expedition, she's called. And that's the first time um, after that that her actual name is used in print. Before that, she's not been known except as a sort of legendary figure of Moses who leads people to the Promised Land, which is across the Mason-Dixon line. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit and, uh, about why I wrote this book, how I came to write it, and um, what it meant to me to write it. It's, it's a question I'm often asked, and um, the, um, somebody I worked with on setting up this event said it was the first question she would like me to answer or to um, look at, and so I'm, I would like to do that. I wrote, the book I wrote before this one was also a nonfiction book. It was about Madam C.J. Walker, who's also an African-American woman who lived from, I see some nods, uh, 1867 to 1919. And so I had done a lot of research uh, on American history of that period and the period before her birth uh, during slavery and during the Civil War. And um, I was very, very moved and interested in the abolitionist, moved by and interested in the abolitionist period of American history, which is pretty incredible. And um, it, first of all, there was that. Second of all, to go back even farther, I grew up in a town in which I was the minority race. Um, we were, I grew up in Greenville, Mississippi, which at that time was about 40% white and 60% uh, black. And the 40% included, we had a very large Asian population, Chinese, and um, a substantial population from the Middle East as well. And the, so white included that. So the, the town was overwhelmingly African American. I have been thinking about race um, my whole life. It's always been a part of my life, and questions about why things were they were the way they were have always puzzled me. And so it's um, it's not something I came to ten years ago when, or fifteen years ago when I began writing the Madam Walker book. Um, it was an opportunity to explore the questions I've had my whole life. And, and also to find out how in the world somebody could do what Madame Walker could do to come out of the poverty she came out of and the sharecropper washerwoman life she came out of to become a, a millionaire and a woman of great style and substance. And how Harriet Tubman 
this, who was a small woman uh, who was unlearned, unschooled. She had, maybe some of you know, um, she was hit by a flying weight uh, that was thrown at somebody else when she was about 12 or 13. It hit her in the forehead. And after that, she had uh, fits of narcolepsy. So you think about somebody making her way through slave country with patrollers and uh, slave catchers and vigilantes and the price on her head, and she falls asleep from time to time. And this is attested to throughout her life that people describe how she would nod off in the middle of a sentence and stay off for maybe 10 seconds, maybe 20 seconds, maybe 30, come back and finish her sentence. Um, there are people who believe she had temporal lobe ep epilepsy, which sometimes comes from a uh, knock in the head. And often when people have that, they begin to, um, to have visions. And sometimes they are uh, visions that come true. They are not, they're visions of the future. And that's, it seems that that's what happened with Harriet. After she got the blow, she began to, she said the Lord gave them to her. And maybe the Lord did. I don't know how she could see what she could see. But she never lost, she said, a passenger on her Underground Railroad. No one ever died. No one was caught. Um, and there are many times when, and then she's not the only one to uh, testify to this, when she would come to a particular place in the road, they always went and something would tell her, don't go that way, go the other way. And um, it was a correct advice because the patrollers were there or the slave catchers were there. So however she got the information, she got it. So I'm looking at, I, I was asked if I wanted to write this book about Harriet Tubman. And um, all of these difficulties were both challenging, they were daunting, and they were very inviting. Because to, people talk a lot about me, why Harriet Tubman, why Madam Walker, why I write a book about, I mean there's a book about cod, there's a book about corn, you know, why? Subject matter is one thing, but our interest in writers goes beyond that, the purest matter of the subject, into a sense of uh, wonder. What is this about? Why is this? What happened to her? How could she do that? Why did she do that? I wrote a book about a murderer um, who acknowledged that she was a murderer and told me and told a jury exactly how she committed two murders. And my question was, and, and yet she was a loving person. And my question in that book was not, what was it like to kill somebody? It was not a true crime book. It was not about murder. It was about how these extremes of what I felt was good and what seemed to be evil in these murders that she commit, could commit, did commit, could exist in the same heart, soul, and life. That was what I wanted to find out. And in this book, I, I wanted to know what, how Harriet Tubman could do what she could do. That was, that was one thing. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing was to go back there to, to have an opportunity to write about a true American hero. These opportunities do not come along often. <laughs> a real hero, an unadulterated hero. There's nothing about her that you can say, well, yes, but this, yes, but she was on the wrong side of that. No. She was, she is our hero. And um, I thought, why would I turn down this opportunity? Because it will never come again, I, I'm sure. And um, it, it is not the daunting part is not what I should pay attention to. I should pay attention to the fact that I feel privileged and honored to be allowed this opportunity. So those were a couple of things that went through. And then the, the final thing I think was a quote, and Frederick Douglass I quoted er, earlier. I, I had read the autobiographies of Frederick Douglass, and any of you who haven't, I urge you to. They're just eloquent. and. Wonderful. And 
when Sarah Bradford published her first autobiography, she asked some people to send in letters to validate that Harriet Tubman had actually done what she said she'd done so that people wouldn't just say, oh, it's all just a story. She didn't really do that. How could one woman do that? And one of the people she asked was Frederick Douglass. And uh, I'm going to read you part of the letter. And this, I thought, man, if Frederick Douglass can write this, I'm on this train. Um, and he wrote it to her. Dear Harriet, I'm glad to know that the story of your eventful life has been written by a kind lady and that the same is so soon to be published. You ask for what you do not need when you call upon me for a word of commendation. I need such words from you far more than you can need them from me, especially where your superior labors and devotion to the cause of the lately enslaved of our land are known as I know them. The difference between us is very marked. Most that I have done and suffered in the service of our cause has been in public and I have received much encouragement at every step of the way. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. I have wrought in the day, you in the night. I have had the applause of the crowd and the satisfaction that comes of being approved by the multitude, while the most that you have done has been witnessed by a few trembling, scarred, and footsore bonds, bondsmen and women whom you have let out of the house of bondage and whose heartfelt, God bless you, has been your reward. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witness of your devotion to freedom and of your heroism. Excepting John Brown of sacred memory, I know of no one who has willingly encountered more perils and hardships to serve our enslaved, enslaved people than you have. Much that you have done would seem improbable to those who do not know you as I know you. It is to me a great pleasure and a great privilege to bear testimony to your character and your works and to say to those whom you, to whom you may come that I regard you in every way truthful and trustworthy, your friend Frederick Douglass. So I thought, okay, <laughs> that'll do. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I, won't, I want to give this a go. Um, and then what I had found out from working on the um, Walker book was in order to research people who were enslaved, um, you have to go to courthouse records of white people who were slave owners because um, enslaved people were not listed as people. They not, were not considered people. And so to get any kind of court records, any kind of assessment records, any kind of audits or taxes, tax records, you have to go to courthouses and look for uh, the names of the white people who were owners in that same area. That's where I started. And um, Harriet was from the eastern shore of Maryland. And I went to that uh, town and spent a lot of time in the courthouse there and in Annapolis in the archives where a lot of papers are there. And if you read the book, you'll see there's, I have, included in here um, a lot of, of um, documents, little slippets of a document that I think are of importance. They're copied and the publisher worked very hard to get these in there because they're very, very hard to read and hard to make uh, legible. Some of them aren't exactly legible, but they show you that the, the document exists. And if you want to go look for them, you too could go look at that uh, document. One of the most important ones, for instance, was there's always been a lot of controversy about when um, Harriet Tubman's exact birth, date, and place are. And um, there is a um, uh, ledger that her... I have to use the term owner because even though I hate to, because as I point out in here, no one owns somebody else, but that's how they were thought of then and that's how they thought of themselves and that's how the enslaved people regarded them. But her owner was a minor. His stepfather kept a ledger um, of expenses 
that he accrued in, in taking care of the enslaved people who belonged to his stepson. Among the uh, list of expenses was um, a charge by a midwife who gave aid in the birth of a child to uh, a woman named Rit. Harriet Tubman's mother's name was uh, Harriet, and she was called Rit, or Ridia. And the child that was born to Rit at that time was Harriet. And there's just no, if you know, I can't go into the how, how we know who, which child was born in which order. But because he kept that ledger, you can look at that date and see when, at least when the midwife was paid. Now, maybe she came a week before that, maybe two weeks before that. But in that season, in 1822, um, in that county was born the child called Araminta Ross, who became Harriet Tubman. And so um, we put that document in the book, a, a, an image of it. So that, and again, it's very hard to read, but it's transcribed below. And you can actually, so you see the handwriting. When I wanted, John Brown wrote a letter after he met Harriet Tubman. He wrote a letter to his son, John Brown Jr., and said, I have just met the most of a man, and her name is Harriet Tubman. <laughs> and um, it's in his hand. And it's also very weird, hard to read. And we looked at it and said, well, you can't really read it. And I said, that's all right. <laughs> it's John Brown's handwriting. And if it's translated or transcribed below, you know, if you, if you study it or use a magnifying glass, you can read it well enough. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. And um, I, I did wanna point out one thing here. I don't know if any of you all, uh, and this is about the writing of history. Uh, if you all noted the uh, piece in The New Yorker, not this week, but last by Jill Lepore. And it's, uh, it has to do with the recent um, so-called memoirs that were made up uh, that's why she wrote it, but it's not specifically about that. It's about the difference between history and fiction and the, the history of history and the history of the writing of fiction and how um, until the uh, 19th century, people didn't think that uh, a list of facts was history. Now, I, I got flack from historians about this book and biographers saying, what, she doesn't know that. Why is she using your, her imagination? Which, I mean, I don't get it. Uh, I don't know how you write history. We write it from where we are now, from what we know now. I write it as me. If you wrote this book, you would write a different book. There's something like 19 biographies of Benjamin Franklin. Now, those aren't just a litany of, he, he was born, he lived, you know, he flew the kite, he died. <laughs> they each have a point of view. Um, but this is what, the, these are mostly quotes from uh, otherwise, but she, here's here are a couple of the quotes. Um, this is from the English writer William Godwin um, in an essay called Of History and Romance, which he wrote in 1797. There is not and never can be any such thing as true history, Godwin insisted. Nothing is more uncertain, more contradictory, more unsatisfactory than the evidence of facts. Every history is incomplete. This is Jill Lepore. Every historian has a point of view. Every historian relies on what is unreliable. Documents written by people who are not under oath and cannot be cross-examined. That is to say, even the best historian has a good deal in common with Jane Austen's book um, called Partial Prejudiced and Ignorant Historian. Before his imperfect source, sources, the historian is powerless, and this is Jane Austen. He must take what they choose to tell, the broken fragments and the scattered ruins of evidence. He could decide merely to reproduce his sources to offer a list of facts, but this is in reality no history. He that knows only on what day the Bastille was taken and on what spot Louis XVI perished knows nothing. <laughs> uh, 
and this is from Teola Four. Um, history concerns facts, but because they have to be arranged and explained, the historian is a dealer not in certainties, but probabilities, and is therefore a romancer. <laughs> so you can, you know, you can chew on that a little bit and see what you think about it. I'm happy to answer any questions any of you have. Um, yes? How many enslaved Africans did she uh, deliver to freedom? Right. And also, where was the Mason Dixie line and where did that name come from? Um, you know, I don't know where Mason, Mason and Dixon were people who measured, didn't they? Surveyors. 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 Ohio, yeah, surveyors. And, and, uh, and the southern states. Yeah. But Ohio was just a lot of mine. Right, the Ohio River. It, where she was going from uh, Maryland up to Pennsylvania, it was um, there at the Pennsylvania line. Um, and that's pretty much how it seems she always went. There some questions of the, if she went some other way from time to time. Um, how many people she brought out is a question that people um, have many, many opinions on. 300 is the magic number. Uh, it seems from all the evidence there probably weren't 300, but how many there were and how many she helped who she didn't actually go down and get is completely unknown. There could be hundreds of people because she navigated. She navigated her niece and her niece's husband and their two children up the Chesapeake to Baltimore and then out without going down there. So she was a source of information for many, many people. How many she actually took with her is uh, a figure that people, I, I didn't get into it because my, you know, my sense of it was, if you get out of enslavement and you go back once, and bring back one person, or no people. I mean, what if you went back and everybody said, no, 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 I'm too scared. You still went back. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is an act of heroism. I, you know, I, when we read these things, we wonder, would I have done it? And, you know, <laughs> We like to think we might have, but uh, it's it's hard to say because it was uh, it was a terrifying things to to do. Mm -hmm. She went back by herself, but other people did help other people. But not with her. She was she operated alone. And uh, you know it's kind of understandable because she knew um, what the dangers were. She knew where the, the difficult places were. She trusted her instincts, um, and also she was very tough on the people. She told them if you start to go back, and she had a gun with her. She never killed anybody, but she said she would kill them because anybody who was too weak to go on would go back and say, you know, they're up there by the the Chesapeake, you know, um, and she knew that she would hold to that line. If you were late, she went. I mean, her brothers were late one time, she went. So she kept, she ran a tight uh, ship or railroad. <laughs> That's right. She was bringing on north. Mm -hmm. And as far as that the Mason Dixon line, the fellow's name was Mason. And this line was to distinguish between the southern states and the union mm -hmm. states. And, so, and Ohio was one of the states. Anything uh, above Kentucky was considered union. And, then, right. and, and this, is, this is why this is named Mason Dixon. Because right. Dixon was one of the other fellows. The surveyors. And I'm from the Midwest. My state, Illinois, was a union state, mm -hmm. but across the Mississippi right. from me is Missouri, which was considered a southern state. So it's kind of a mixture. But you know what? I never 
in all the research I did, I never heard one abolitionist or one person involved with the Underground Railroad call it the Mason-Dixon line. No, it was always this river or that river uh, that you had to cross. It didn't have anything to do with somebody's line. Um, I think today is the first time I've ever used the words. I don't know why. <laughs> Okay, um, she never learned to read or write, and um, she was some a, a woman in Massachusetts attempted to teach her, but this is way late in her life. She was probably in her 40s by then, and um, it, it just it, what uh, Franklin Sanborn wrote this and said she's not succeeding or it's not you know it's not happening. There are a few uh, reasons that might. Uh, you might think about. One is the, the damage to her head. Second is it's hard to learn to read when you're that old. Third is that she didn't, she trusted what she had. She trusted her voices and she said she never had to, to think about train schedules. She just went and sat at the train. I mean that was her life and that's how she operated. And so maybe she felt like just the same way she uh, went alone that it would interfere you know, that she wouldn't then have her voices. I, this is, I'm just speculating here. It's not known. Intuition. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, that, that her intuition might be affected by that. And she wanted to, she'd done some powerful things and she didn't want it uh, interfered with by, you know, some kind of different way of operating than she already had. What was the other? Absolutely, Harriet Tubman used quilt. She did say that she had made a quilt that she gave to a white lady before she left, right before she left. And undoubtedly, that was Hannah Leverton, the Quaker lady who helped her. She could not, this just as you cited, she could not give it to anybody in her family because that would mean they knew she was leaving. And if they knew, then they, they would have to say, these were, and her father was a truth teller and he never wanted to know when his sons or anybody was leaving because when the uh, plantation owner came and said, have you seen your son? He could say no and he wasn't lying. Mm -hmm. So she could not give it to her family. She was not <laughs> a seamstress, so it's sort, of, um, it's sort of funny to imagine her. She was a real outdoor person who liked to you know, chop and hoe and lift and she was really strong sitting making a quilt, but maybe she did. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. That's all right. Uh, may I explain to the teacher mm -hmm. may know about the quilt. Uh, quilting is a, a European form of uh, sewing and making bed covers. And they had a certain type of pattern that they that and the sign for you to follow. Slaves are our ancestors were very inventive. They may not have been able to read or write, but they have, and they we still have an inventive way of doing things. Sometimes it gets us in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and their concept of making books, because they needed a cover for the bed to keep warm, and their uh, concept of design was different from the Europeans. And some place along the line, just as you Speaking of the tubbing, uh, the designs in the quilt weren't just figures or bunches of different kinds of material and color, but a certain way a design was put in, a certain color was used was a direction. And it, in it, it was meant to say whether if you went to this area, you were safe, or if you went to another area, it would be uh, difficult for you and would be turned back to the slave owner. And many people would hang the quilt along the way. And the slave, and because as the young lady here said, well, our people were not allowed to uh, read or write. They were people who would be killed if 
they taught our people to read and write. So this was no, just like gum. Gum for a form of communication. And, and um, that's what the quote for a form of communication. Mm -hmm. And now it's such a highly organized and pray and uh, price of form of artistry that you don't use it when you did it anymore, you use it to hang on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> songs that said, don't come, it's dangerous now, she said, um, and when she sang, Mo don't, Go Down Moses was uh, the plantation honors for bad, the singing of Go Down Moses, uh, but she was known as Moses because of uh, a Moses leading his people across the Red Sea, and um, she would sing that and they would know that Moses was, uh, was, was there. There were other songs that says, Let's go, time to go. And uh, this was a way of communicating. She'd go out in the woods. She never went to people's houses. Word would pass, Moses is coming, Moses is coming. And one man came to her father once, to uh, Harriet's father, and said, tell me when Moses is gonna be here next. Um, and she would go out in the woods and sing, which meant, whoever wants to come, come on and they would hear it, and word would have been sent around ahead of time saying, she's coming soon, she's coming soon, and they would gather. Uh, but it was, it was all, I mean, you know, as, as, as the lady says, it, it was against the law to learn to read and write, but just oppressed people learn how their oppressors operate, and they know how to work that way of operating. They know the clues better than the, the people do know themselves. They pay attention and they find their own ways of communication. You know, drums were a way of communicating, uh, in musical instruments, singing, and all that. Mm -hmm. How could she talk? Oh man, she could talk. You can talk. She just couldn't, and, and you know, she, the way she talked was, this is why oral history is so important, because people told her stories and people told her mother's stories and all the history was handed down. That's the history they had. She knew, for instance, her mother told her that she should have been freed when she was 45 years old, that that was in uh, the will of the man who had enslaved her. And that was a story that had been handed down from her grandmother to her mother to Harriet. And it, it, Harriet went and hired a lawyer. She was able to, uh, she could freelance sometimes. She had, she was quite an operator. I mean, she was an entrepreneur of, of a kind. She, uh, and people liked her and they trusted her. Um, and she paid a lawyer to look back and find that will. And he did. And she should have been free, but she was not, even though it's said in the will that she should have been free. But she could talk plenty. I mean, she could tell stories, she could perform, she could sing. Um, people loved to hear her talk. She could entertain. I mean, if you read the um, descriptions of what it was like when she would go to meetings of abolitionists to raise money for the Underground Railroad, and she would perform and, and tell what it was like to be in slavery because there was a myth around that the slaves were happy. And so she went to say, this is what it's like. And uh, she was really effective. Mm -hmm. I was uh, wondering uh, about what you were talking about with regards to the research and the mm -hmm. point that you made that uh, in order to research uh, individuals who were enslaved, you have to research the people who were enslaved and own them. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, likewise, there have been many people, white people, who have been voiced by She's right. not being right over the uh, years and years and years that her story has been told. And uh, I'm assuming based on your story that you identify as white, right? I'm identified as white. I, I, or do you? Are you? Yeah. Okay, so based on your story, you are yet another white person right. telling her story. So I was wondering what insights you had you know, in, in researching and, and telling your story. 
writing this book um, on race and uh, you know socio politically um, with regard to having created this other story, another story. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know exactly how to answer that. I mean, my, I would not have written this book or the book before if I hadn't been, first of all, interested in uh, race and also um, horrified by our history, our American history. And I, I keep saying she is our hero because I think she is. And I think she, uh, she is her story is uh, a necessity to be told, whoever tells it. And I heard from a historian who wrote another biography of Harriet Tubman a few years ago, and she wrote an email and said, may a thousand Harriets bloom. And that's been my position of, I mean, if there can be that many biographies of Benjamin Franklin, I mean, whether the person's a man or a woman or a black person or a white person, I think whatever he or she can bring to the story of her heroism uh, and uh, her accomplishments would be um, uh, useful and uh, a good part of our education as a country to, to pay attention to these things. Um, but as I said, I, race has been uh, on my mind from child babyhood, whenever I started thinking. <laughs> I do, I do, and I, I think absolutely that's going to happen, and we'll have more biographies of women of all colors, because that's the other part of this equation. Uh, many, many more biographies of male, whatever it is, soldiers, artists, uh, writers, than there are of female. And so, but it's, uh, you know, it's probably been too long coming, um, but at least things have changed. Somewhat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a bit, I should say. Mm -hmm. How many guys did the Jenny come with different languages? I didn't hear that. Can somebody? How many languages did Harry come to speak? One. One. <laughs> Marilyn. <laughs> you know what she said when she went down to South Carolina and the people on the island uh, were people who call, are called Gullah background and she said I couldn't understand them and they couldn't understand me so it wasn't just slave language it was yes. a particular region and you mm -hmm. no no it was not built you know it was you know how you've seen how it used to be uh, firemen passed the people in buckets along. That's the Underground Railroad was something like that. It was me doing my part here and somebody else doing his part here and somebody else doing the, his part there. The Underground Rail, Railroad had to remain secret because it was illegal. People could have been put in prison for a long time for participating in it. So it, it It was, it was called, and it's not known where the, the uh, phrase came from. There was one, there's, uh, somebody said that somebody else said that um, some enslaved people were escaping and it seemed like they disappeared, like there was an underground railroad that whisked them away across the Ohio River. And uh, so it became, that may or may not be how the phrase became, but it set once it was there. And um, it, now it's, it's, I mean, there's a, a book of, um, a, a really important book called The Underground Railroad, which is, is um, a man in Philadelphia who kept the record of enslaved people who came through there on their way to Canada.
And so it was called that then as well. Mm -hmm. I work for Caledonia State Park, which is located 20 miles west of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also located just north of the Mason Dixon Line. And it's 18,000 acres that was owned by the abolitionist Thaddeus Stevens. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thaddeus Stevens lost money on the Caledonia Ironworks the 30 years that he owned it from 1830 to 1865. And so the circumstantial evidence is that Caledonia Ironworks was just a front business for the Underground Railroad. Oh, really? So we, we think it was a major conduit, but you know, there's no, there's no real clear evidence, direct evidence. I didn't know if you had any. I do not know, that. but that is Stevens was a real hero. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Anybody else? Are there any other questions? No. Thank you so much. I think now you know why I wanted very much to have <laughs> Beverly here with us. And I remind you again that her book, Harriet Tubman, A Biography, Imagining a Life, is on sale in the gift store. She has signed it. There are signed copies downstairs, so they're extra special. And if you have any other questions afterwards, maybe um, she'll be happy to, to answer them. Thank you so much for coming today.